It's good to be here. This is my third visit to Ethiopia, probably my most exciting one. Um, so let me really thank the leadership of the church for uh, not just asking me to lecture, but also to, to be here with you and uh, preach God's word to you. Uh, the title of my sermon is simply the phrase, but God, and it is found in Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. The Bible reading that we had earlier provides the background to the words that we are about to uh, look at. So instead of only reading verse 20, we will read the context. And so let me quickly give you the context. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the story. But at this point, um, Jacob, the father to Joseph, has died. And the brothers of Joseph uh, recognize the fact that they are in mortal danger. They had tried to kill him, as we already saw, and now they were completely at his mercy. And so they uh, come up with a story we will just read. My interest is in Joseph's response. So we'll read verse uh, 15 down to verse 21. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, it may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, your father gave this command before he died. Now, it's probably a lie. They're trying to use whatever means they can not to die now. Say to Joseph, verse 17, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now, please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. Uh, but Joseph said to them, and this is really the beginning of the statement, do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me. And here is the phrase, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Uh, these are the words that Joseph spoke towards the end of a very dramatic story. In fact, the next paragraph that we, you could read on your own speaks about Joseph finally dying. It, he's, he's come to the end of his life. But it's, it's a story that most of us can identify with, not so much to the extremity that it went. A person being thrown into a, a dry well to be killed and in the process sold as a slave and so on. But nonetheless, as long as we are here on earth, we experience trials of one kind or another. It may be a trial like the one that Joseph himself went through where individuals maliciously try to destroy you. Within the context of the family, within the context of school or work, within the context of the wider community. But individuals whom you know personally hate you to the point of actually wanting to destroy you 
in one way or the other. But it could also be trials related to, to health. It is one thing to have a common cold and get over it. It's quite another, for instance, to be involved in an accident, a car accident, and be maimed as a result of that. To have a chronic illness that you have to live with for the rest of your life. To end up with your friends getting on in life and for you remaining behind because of that situation. Or it could be related to finances. You've done your best, you've invested, and then everything seems to come falling apart and you end up in a state of poverty and you seek your best and still you find that you can hardly come out of that very difficult situation. That with every effort you make with one step to go forward, it's as if you are simply going backwards two steps. And perhaps the most difficult is in the marriage situation where your dream of a dream marriage collapses before you because of a husband or a wife that is wayward. And you try all you can to, to fix the marriage, to, to if, if it was in your power to put your hands into a person's heart, to turn them round, you would. But you can't. And a marriage that at one time was celebrated on the wedding day now goes from bad to worse and perhaps even to the divorce court. It may not be the marriage. It could be children that you've raised. You've poured in everything. And yet as they grow up, they break your heart because they choose to go the ways of evil. And in the process, you have to shed many tears because of what has happened in the family. And many individuals reach old age. They look at what has taken place with their children and ask the question, was this worth the why? Is this what I have lived for? Trials. Trials. Joseph, no doubt here, had his fair share. And the point that I want to raise here is that if you do not handle trials in a biblical way, in the way, for instance, in which Joseph handled his own trials, often you end up on one end and it is the end of depression and also the end of bitterness on that extreme end. Depressed so that even when you are in a place like this and individuals are singing the praises of God, you can see joy on their faces. You are saying to yourself, well, you can sing like that because you've not been where I have been. If your experiences were like mine, you would indeed be miserable. And as I said, what is even worse is bitterness. Bitterness towards individuals. Bitterness towards friends, spouses, children, neighbors, churchmates, and so on, especially if they are the ones at whose hands you have suffered the trial. And as someone has rightly said, bitterness is like drinking poison and hoping the other person will die. In other words, it's you it kills, it's you it destroys. Thankfully, as we come to the end of Genesis and we are looking at Joseph, that's not the story that we see in him. We are not looking at a depressed man. 
we are not looking at a bitter man despite 22 years of his life going down the drain. 22 years of suffering. We will look at that story in a moment. But the question is, why not? What is it that stopped this man who went through the kind of things we shall see in a moment from being depressed and bitter? What is it? May I suggest to you that it lies in those two words, but God. But God. But God. First of all, in Joseph's mind, he was very clear that the outworking of history is not left to the whims and wills of human beings. That there are actually two planners in history, God and man. Let's go back to the statement that he makes there for us. Genesis chapter 50 and verse 20. He says there, as for you, he's looking at his brothers, you meant evil against me. In other words, you planned and you wanted to destroy me. But you were not the only planners. There was another one, but God. But God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive. In other words, whatever it is that has happened in your life, whatever it is that has happened in Ethiopia, we've been studying church history here, and we were looking at roughly 2,000 years over a period of, of four days. And the point again there is that we were relating to human beings. There were names, and human beings did this and that, and sometimes brought about a glorious period, and other, other times brought about a terrible period. Hundreds, thousands of people slayed, murdered. It's not just human beings involved in all that. There was another planner, and it is God. So there is the human, and there is the divine. There is the creator, and there is the creature. Joseph knew this. So even as his brothers threw him into that well, got him out, sold him off as a slave, and as he went into Egypt, finally sold into Potiphar's household, and then having Potiphar's own wife come up with a false accusation that he tried to rape her, and he goes even further and is thrown into jail in the land of Egypt, far away from all his friends and family. Joseph was saying, these individuals want to harm me. But God. God is also behind what is happening here. It's not just these people. God is also behind this. Two individuals, Pharaoh's cupbearer and Pharaoh's baker, come thrown into prison as well. He ministers to them and begs them, especially the cup bearer, that when you get back and you are restored, please remember me before Pharaoh, please. Well, the guy, as soon as he gets back there, forgets about Joseph. And he has to spend a few more years in that prison cell.
there are two planners there. Those human beings, yes, but also there is God. And what we have here finally is a strange outworking of history. What we might perhaps refer to as it just so happened. Huh? That, that Pharaoh had this dream. And it just so happened that the cup bearer noticed he was looking a little um, miserable. And it just so happened that Pharaoh shared with him about what he had dreamt. And of course, the magicians and others had failed to, to interpret his dream. And it just so happened that the cup bearer remembered what he had forgotten. That there was a gentleman in prison who was able to interpret his dream. And he said, ah, I've remembered my sin. I had made a promise to a gentleman. Perhaps he might be able to interpret. And that's how after 22 years, there was a dramatic change of circumstances. And Joseph did not only come out of prison. He interpreted the dream and was promoted to the second highest place in Egypt. Right under Pharaoh himself. Now, let's think. 22 years. You know, when we are going through trials and they last one week, we think God hates us. Or perhaps he's been sleeping somewhere and needed to be woken up. And when that trial lasts one month, one year, I dare not take it to one decade because probably by that time we've become so miserable that we are now this thin like a broomstick because we have been crying and crying and crying ourselves to sleep. We've concluded there is no God because of what this reality around us is. Joseph knew that all this, there were two minds at work. And however difficult it may have been to process, there were still Two minds at work. You meant it for evil. You were engineers of my sorrow. But I also know there was another mind. But God. What we also see from this little phrase, but God, is a contrast of two minds or two wills. The very word but suggests that there is a contrast here. As for you, when you were planning, you meant evil against me, but God, when he was planning, meant it for good. And basically that's history. On one hand, we have human beings. And on the other, we have God. But here's the point. These are not two equal beings. This is not like you and me playing chess. And therefore, we are surrounded by people who do not know the outcome of this. Rather, 
This is the creature versus the creator. Guess who wins? Many years ago when my kids were just growing up, I taught them how to play chess. I loved it because I was always winning. <laughs> Until it became unpredictable. And my love for that game begin, began to dwindle. I would win, they would win. I would win, they would win. Well, a few months later down the line, not even years, they would win and win and win. I stopped playing chess. <laughs> By the time they were in their teenage years, and they said, Dad, come on, let's play just now. I'm busy. I'm busy, too busy. <laughs> well, the truth of the matter is that although there are two minds, there is actually one mind that finally wins the day. It doesn't matter what evil men and women will plot against you and against me. If any of that finally takes place, it is because God allowed it. It is because the sovereign Lord of the universe had it in his will. Let's think about that for a moment. You see, for us as human beings, because we don't know all things, we often plan and then we discover we forgot to factor in one or two things. And so we, we revise our plans. Because if we're going to achieve our stated goal, there are too many other parts that we are not aware of and when we realize what they are about, we have to get back to the drawing board. Even just planning a trip, you, you've got everything in place, but hey, you, you discover your car can't start. Oh, your car starts, but the person you're supposed to travel with is unwell. And so you have to start thinking of going with somebody else or postponing by a day or two. So many other things that make you change your plans. God is not like that. God is the all-knowing God. And so his plan for history is a plan that he made even before time began. Because he's, he's all-knowing. There's no little factor in history that makes him rush back to the drawing board. No! He is God! And therefore, instead of thinking that he has made plans, we should be saying he has made the plan. That's it. And history is but the outworking of that plan. In theology, it is referred to as the decree. Not so much decrees, as though there are many little plans, but the decree of God, which he has brought into action, and it's now outworking itself. Another part of the reason why we as human beings have to revise our plans, is that our abilities in terms of power is limited. Whether it is physical power or financial power and so on. We, we often find that we, we, we've got our plans. You want to buy a house. And you, you, you rush there to, go, to, to, to see this house that was being advertised. And, and, and when you get there, it's, it's beautiful until you say, how much? <laughs> uh, 
And when the figure comes out, you, you realize, yeah, 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 yeah. Your, your plans won't work. You definitely are not going to live in this house. And often, that's where our major disappointment is. Remember, I was talking about a souring relationship. Here's somebody you really, really, really love. And then the relationship grinds to a halt. Some now 38 years ago, I fell in love with the lady of my dreams. And then the day I told her that I'm not planning to be an engineer for the rest of my life, I'm planning to be a pastor, I noticed her face fell. And for the next six months, I was hoping my hands could get into that heart and warm it up again towards me. After six months, we met, and she told me, sorry, we just have to call it off. And I've never forgotten that six months of my life was a living hell. I had just started working in the mines, and in what is called a mine mess, where we would have our meals, it's as if the devil knew what was happening with me. Because there used, there used to be some soft music that was playing in the background. And almost every time I'd go in for a meal, there was this song that would be playing, and it had the words that said, love me still, just a little bit longer. <laughs> I know that we can make it. Our love is much too young to break. Yeah, now I can laugh. But at that time, I would lose my appetite and go back to my apartment and just cry myself to sleep. And that's what, really, it went on for about a year. And I've never forgotten the number of times I would say to God, God, I thought that because I said to you, I want to save you, that you, you would give me this wonderful, wonderful relationship with this lady. We had to revise. And thank the Lord, three years later, he gave me the lady who's been my wife now for a good 30 to 35 years. His will. He didn't have to revise. He knew exactly whom he had in mind. But hey, that two to three years in between? Eh? You understand? Have you been there? <laughs> the point I'm trying to stress out of all this is quite simple. And it is this, that whereas we have to revise because of our inabilities, God doesn't need to. His will will finally be realized because he is the omnipotent God, the all-powerful God. And therefore, those negative situations that may have come into your life, it's not that he's been biting his nails wondering what to do. No. For him, it is still according to plan. According to plan. According to plan. May I also quickly add that because these plans were made or these 
historic plan is something God put together before even time began. Here's some news. He did not consult anybody. Not even you. Because you were not there. He acted in complete sovereignty. Absolute sovereignty. And that's what is captured for us in those words in uh, Romans and uh, chapter 11, just before the words that opened up our worship this morning. Romans and chapter 11, beginning with verse 33. All the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Or who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To whom be glory forever. Amen. There's one person who desperately needed to learn this. And it was Job. Job was a righteous man, but we all know the tragedy that took place. He lost all his wealth, he lost all his children, and the time came when he lost almost all his health. Initially, wow, the words that he spoke were glorious, isn't it? The Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Remember those words, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I will depart, the Lord gave, the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. We read those words and we say, wow. I'm definitely not Job. Well, fast forward, his health is taken away. His friends come to visit him. And for seven days, they don't even speak to him because of the extremity of his suffering. When he now opens his mouth, he begins to say, may the day that I was born, the sun should never rise on that day, and so on. Where is God? I, I need to talk to him. How can he do this to me? And so on. Well, finally, God shows up. And when God shows up, he doesn't begin to try to say, now, Job, actually, look, I've got a good ending for you. You know, trust me. No, no, no. He, he simply says, Job, where were you when I planned this creation? Where were you? When I brought this into being, could you tell me, were you sitting next to me giving me advice? Look at the intricacies of this complex universe. Did you even bring in a little suggestion? And as he went on and went on, Job said, Lord, Lord, stop. Please, please, please stop. I've, I've realized my mistake. He says, no, no, no. I haven't finished. Sit here. Let me ask you. And finally, Job says, you know what? I realize I spoke too quickly. I spoke about things too wonderful for me to process. Friends, that's a lesson we all desperately need to learn. We were not there. God has put into place a perfect universe, balanced in all its intricacies. And he has put into that perfect universe what really is a perfect history. And he has brought us into it. All we are seeing is our little lives. That's all we are seeing. Our little lives. We don't know the world behind this. We need to humble ourselves and say, God, you are God. Many years ago, we used to have watches. I don't think we have them these days anymore because they've gone from mechanical watches now to electrical or electronic watches. 
But you see of watches where in front, like the ones we even have now, you, you have just two or three hands, the hour hand, the minute hand, and the second hand. And they, they, they are all moving in the same direction. Okay, one faster than the others, but still they are all moving in the same direction. But when you opened the back of those watches, there were many wheels there. Some larger than others, some moving faster than others, some apparently going forward, others apparently going the opposite direction. And all those many wheels were producing that movement in front with perfect precision. Well, that's actually history. We only see those hands. That's all we see. And perhaps for now, you are the hour hand. And everybody's going right past you like this. Everybody. The minute hand. Whew, and you are saying, my friends are married. Me, I'm not. Why, Lord? What's the problem? And if your close friends were even the second hand, every time you wink, they've gone past. And yes, there you are, weeping yourself to sleep. Lord, my life is static, Lord, static. There is a whole world behind there that you don't see. The many wheels that God is moving. The many wheels. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. One more but God. And it brings out not just a contrast of wheels, but also a contrast of purpose. A contrast of purpose. Back again to our story. As for you, you meant evil against me. So this is not just a difference of will. It is an evil purpose to harm me. But God, but God had a different purpose. God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Well, friends, First of all, in the bigger picture, Joseph is a type of Christ. He's probably the only character in the Old Testament that is a picture of Jesus who is absolutely blameless from beginning to end in the entire story. We, we have a number of others that prefigure the Lord Jesus like King David, but you know King David. Okay, I won't even go into that. But for Joseph, you go from beginning to end and you, you don't see him actually sinning against God in any way. And just as Joseph was handpicked by God to save so many people from starvation, so also Jesus was handpicked by God to save his people from their sin. And just as it was not God's plan to save everyone from starvation, it is not God's plan to save every human being from hell. So it's obvious that this picture brings to our minds something of God's grace. To us spiritually, prefigured in God's grace to his people in Old Testament times through Joseph. So even in that bigger picture, which no doubt is, is the bigger picture in the mind of God as this story points forward into the New Testament, that we may be shown that our salvation was not an afterthought on the part of God but that even as Jesus was hunted like a wild animal until finally nailed to the cross, God was not shaken. It was all 
according to plan that today you and I may be rejoicing in this great and glorious salvation upon us simply acknowledging God forgive me God forgive us and like these brothers who were saying you know our father said our father said we shouldn't even bring in those stories we should simply say as they said here please forgive the transgressions that we have committed against you Lord. that's the highest level but if you're a child of God God also brings it to another level. And it is this. Your father loves you. With an everlasting love. And whatever it is that you are going through, and however many months and years you have felt like that wheel at the back of the watch that is going the wrong way. His aim in the end is to do you good. All things work together. All things work together for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. Or as some other versions would put it, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who are the called according to his purpose. The thing is to learn to trust, especially when you are going through those periods of darkness, to be able to trust that he's my father. He rules the universe. He's the sovereign one. Would he have chosen me in eternity? Brought me to himself? after his own son has paid his dear life's blood for me, and now to simply dash me against a rock and leave me bleeding there in some meaningless turn of events? Is he that capricious, this God? And I hope the answer comes back to you. No, 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 a thousand times no. Though men and women may be intending to harm me, but God, but God, my Father in heaven, who's in control of all things, means to bring about not only my good, but through me, the good that will bless so many other people. That even this trial, this difficulty that seems to be unending somehow in unscrutable ways, in, in ways I cannot understand, he means it for my good, for the good of others, and for his own glory. May I suggest to you that it is this that stopped Joseph from being depressed and from being bitter. May I also suggest to you that this truth you desperately if everything right now is sunny, you've got a blue sky over your life, everything is going well, take this truth and keep it in your pocket. Trust me, you will need it. You will need it. Sooner rather than later. 
believe it, that in the midst of all history, God is not asleep. He's planned all things. And ultimately, it's his will that prevails and that he is a good God. He is a good God. Merciful. Those tears, they mean a lot to him. He is a loving a love like no other. He gave his own son for you. He is a gracious God. He's not treating you as your sins deserve. He's a good God. Amen?